Now, uh, hydrocephalus is something we see uh, whether or not in trauma or a patient's found down, brought to us, unclear etiology of why, but they get a head CT and this is what we see. And so we're left thinking there's something about this uh, scan. Uh, you know, there's something about this um, hydrocephalus or, or ventricular megaly at this point that uh, is related to the poor exam that we see before us. So, you know, when we're thinking about cerebrospinal fluid diversion, placing a drain into the uh, ventricular space, obviously we want to make sure that there's no obstructive lesions, no obstructive masses uh, that are apparent on our head CT. So typically the first step, if you see a patient found down, oftentimes unclear if there was a trauma involved or not, uh, you see a patient like this, we actually just had a patient like this come in uh, this past week, unclear what had happened, found down on the street, massive hydrocephalus. Uh, and next question, anything obstructive, we could not appreciate anything obstructive. So the patient had a, a drain placed emergently. In a lot of these situations too, you may see some amount of intraventricular blood. And so the question is always, how do you manage that? What do you do? Now, the first things first, you wanna treat the hydrocephalus. You wanna treat the compression uh, that the excess cerebrospinal fluid is causing on the remaining brain tissue. Uh, now, intraventricular hemorrhage management varies in terms of um, the amount of blood, the location of the blood and whether it actually causes the uh, drain to clot off. Um, I won't go, get into the specifics of that, but I think that's something you often see. So being comfortable, I would say communicating and understanding that that kind of throws a monkey wrench into things is important. So for instance, having uh, a plan in place, uh, you know, if a patient also has an intraventricular hemorrhage, being able to communicate that I would still place a drain. I'm, you know, trying to treat hydrocephalus, understanding that if the drain should clot off, I might need to consider next uh, next steps, whether it's trying to see if something could be injected through the catheter to help dislodge the clot or um, intermittent drainage. Um, some folks will even do uh, lumbar drains. Um, that's more common, not in the traumatic setting, but oftentimes with um, with uh, aneurysmal um, related uh, CSF diversion. So I think being able to communicate that uh, on the wards is always impressive. Just that, you know, there's an understanding that other issues can be at play. And even if you don't have a plan in place uh, as to how you might address every possibility, you've at least thought through that there are these, these um, potential side effects lurking. So uh, this is just a schematic on external ventricular drain placement. And again, I think in terms of our value, placing a drain in a timely fashion can truly save someone's life. So we always look off the midline about 12 centimeters behind the nasion. I like to go about four and a half off the midline. So 12 behind, four and a half across, and you double check mid pupillary line. And then again, you wanna think in your head, uh, the ventricular system, and where you're aiming. So you're aiming, um, you know, they always say towards the ipsilateral medial canthus and then also the tragus on the opposite. Uh, you wanna kind of get this line in your head, the tragus here. Uh, so you're trying to, um, trying to basically aim, you know, towards, it's, it's almost posterior and, you know, inferior obviously. And uh, kind of this angle and this trajectory as if you're looking down on the person's uh, scalp. So I think having a sense in general of where the ventricular system should lie is important. Getting a sense of the tragus on either side and sort of the imaginary line you can draw between them uh, is important as well. So the image on the right here, you can see this, this shows the angulation actually, uh, I would say better kind of shows you, you want to be a little bit inwards and then uh, uh, posterior as well. So I'll just quickly go over, uh, quickly go over the Brain Trauma Foundation uh, guidelines. Uh, so I was going to mention uh, the uh, Brain Trauma Foundation guidelines are pretty accessible online and moving forward should actually be updated uh, largely online as well. Uh, and again, it's something I think to, um, I would say is impossible to memorize cover to cover, but the point being that you know they exist and they guide a lot of practice. So 
important to cite that and at least know that it's you know something to have in the mix in terms of when to make a decision uh, to operate or to intervene. So just wanted to mention in terms of monitoring, because that's always a, you know, a challenge, especially when you're uh, on the wards, you're taking call. This is a great question to be asked in terms of, well, should this patient get a monitor? Or, you know, if we've decided the patient's not a surgical candidate, they're a trauma patient, falling down, et cetera, what do we do? You know, what's our role here and, and what can we provide um, in terms of management? So you know, when we think about intracranial pressure monitoring, whether it's via an external ventricular drain, whether it's via a bolt or some combination thereof, uh, you know, we think about monitoring in patients who have had a traumatic brain injury defined as GCS of, you know, eight or below, uh, as well as an abnormal head CT. Now, if we think about an abnormal head CT, you know, may include all of these things, you know, brute, you know, contusions, swelling, et cetera. Uh, we do think it's indicated in, in severe cases, uh, even if the patient has a normal scan, if uh, we see a, a few factors, um, whether the patient has a very poor exam, motor posturing, certain age range, and then systolic blood pressure. So, we know that 50% uh, or so patients uh, who develop ICP uh, at some point in their hospitalization, uh, typically fairly early on, um, may have um, a relatively uh, negative scan. Now, this is also, I would take with a grain of salt because you know a lot of this um, um, data or what's been studied is um, somewhat outdated with the existing scanners because that's always evolving and improving. Uh, but I think the idea is, even if a patient comes in with a quote unquote normal head CT, no acute blood, et cetera, if the mechanism of injury just seems like something that's pretty severe, their exam is poor. So for instance, high speed motor vehicle accident, a uh, patient who's giving you a poor exam, I think your threshold of suspicion should appropriately be high in terms of potential issues to develop high ICP. So in terms of other con conditions for monitoring, um, you know, frankly, this is, uh, I would say, uh, variable and still a topic of discussion. And there are periodically uh, consensus conferences or guidelines committees or, you know, different uh, types of thinking around these issues. Uh, so, you know, diffuse exonal injury um, is, is a concern as well. And I didn't mention this because it's non-operative, but uh, diffuse axonal injury is something we see, uh, again, high velocity trauma. So motor vehicle accidents, motorcycle accidents are another, um, you know, kind of part of the history that uh, should, you know, make your ears perk up. But oftentimes we see uh, changes in white matter, whether it's, you know, small punctate hemorrhages. Um, and frankly, there are situations where MRI doesn't necessarily pick up diffuse axonal injury uh, reliably. And so in part, it may be a clinical diagnosis based upon uh, a patient's poor neurologic exam and also um, uh, you know, the absence of a clear structural reason for the poor neurologic exam. Uh, but getting back to the Milan, Milan Consensus Conference, uh, you know, I think what was interesting is that you know, the idea of when a patient should be monitored and, and who, who would be an appropriate candidate was somewhat broadened. You know, the idea that uh, you know, if patients are even after a surgery, would they be appropriate for monitoring? Some folks feel yes. Um, some folks say, well, they've had their decompressive craniectomy. It may not necessarily be valuable information. Diffuse axonal injury, again, something we didn't think was appropriate for monitoring, uh, perhaps, and there's some who argue that that is a appropriate indication for monitoring. I just mentioned that because there is variability, and I would say some disagreement in terms of what the ideal candidate for a, a monitor uh, could and should be. So this continues to evolve. Um, now, there's also some kind of practice-based, I would say, issues. <laughs> Excuse me. And I would say one thing I remember from uh, being a student on the wards is it's always difficult because there's clinical practice that's often institutional, um, the way an institution has functioned. There's practice based on, excuse me, 
there's practice based on guidelines, you know, things that are in the literature that you can access uh, during your training. And then there's other things that folks pick up either uh, due to the medical legal environment in their area or just kind of how they think practice should be. So it can often be very confusing because you're told, oh, you always have to do this. Then you go to another site and, oh, you always have to do this. And those two things are in complete contradiction. So I bring up these points only to say that I think if you're asked, you know, when should I put in a monitor? And do you think monitoring is appropriate for this patient? You know, you're assessing someone on the floor. <clears throat> I think the goal and the idea is you're being able to convey that you understand that there is some variability. Guidelines such as the Brain, Brain Trauma Foundation exist uh, and can maybe help guide your practice, but they aren't necessarily the firm and fast rules for what you will see uh, when you're on the wards. Uh, and the other example, too, is that, um, you know, if you have a trauma patient taken emergently, urgently to the operating room for diffuse injuries, whether it's um, blood in the abdomen, a big hip fracture, something like that, and there's not a great neurologic assessment, unclear if the patient's been sedated, they had a breathing tube placed in the field, unclear how much of that is medication related. Um, there is a role for monitoring when you have a patient like this that you're concerned about but needs uh, other cares. Now, what's interesting too, is when we think about intracranial monitoring and the parameters, you know, we talk about elevations above 20 or 22 uh, that are persistent, lasting more than two minutes. Uh, we are concerned uh, and would administer hyperosmolar therapy, whether it's mannitol, hypertonic saline, or a combination thereof. Uh, Intractable ICP elevations, there's a role for surgery. If the patient has just diffuse brain swelling, um, horribly elevated ICPs, you've failed all the non-operative management strategies, whether it's hyperosmolar therapy, obviously head of the bed positioning, you know, a short-term um, uh, hyperventilation. Uh, you've tried you know, even uh, phenobarb coma to try to relax and relieve as much compression and uh, swelling, excuse me, as possible. Um, there's a role for decompressive uh, craniectomy. Now, again, I would say that uh, uh, after a craniotomy, uh, when an ICP monitor may be used, <clears throat> may be associated with other factors. If there's any concerns about brain swelling at the time of surgery, whether a patient is hypoxic or has any issues, of hypo issues with hypotension. Um, some would suggest an ICP monitor placed intraoperatively or immediately postoperatively would be helpful. Um, and that's with a craniotomy or even a craniectomy. Uh, but again, I think um, the last point here is still an area of controversy in terms of monitoring and the setting of patients without a bone flap. Um, so just understand that your local environment may have a very strong dogma in terms of how they approach these patients. And they might say, this is it. And this is the way you should be doing it. There is in the broader community, a little bit of variability and certainly some controversy in terms of what the best approach would be. Um, I'll just kind of briefly talk about this and really skip over this. But, you know, when we think about monitoring patients with traumatic brain injuries, imaging is a workhorse. Invasive monitoring, we, you know, we briefly touched on, there's kind of, I think of it in two buckets. Hey everyone, Ryan Rad here from neurosurgerytraining.org. If you like that video, subscribe and donate to keep our content available for medical students across the world.